everyone. Uh, thanks for attending this webinar. Um, my name is Chris Trigstead. I'm the Marketing and Network Director here at Biomedics. I've had the pleasure of working uh, with Dr. Chopra of Mimit Health over the past couple of years um, on our PadNet program and uh, helping him uh, improve his practice and uh, especially through his digital transformation. Um, you'll see a QR code uh, throughout the presentation. Um, feel free to scan that with your smartphone and uh, you can get Dr. Chopra's uh, contact credentials um, online and reach out to Dr. Chopra if you want to discuss further. In addition, uh, we'll have a QA session at the end, um, but feel free to ask questions in the chat window. You can access the chat or the QA, uh, Q and A windows at the bottom of your screen. So um, we may not answer the questions right away, but we'll make sure to wrap everything up at the end of the session. And I'll let you uh, take over Dr. Chopra. Excellent, thank you. You're welcome. And uh, thanks for having me on there. And uh, for some of those who know, don't know me, I'm the founder, president, CEO at Mimit Health. Uh, been doing this for a fair amount of time, 30 plus years. I've been blessed with getting some recognition as a congressional medal for outstanding contributions in patient care and teaching. And I've been around doing a lot of stuff for quite a while. I want to thank each one of you for attending this webinar and spending your valuable time. Uh, you'll see some of our, uh, some of the salesforce.com swagger as well. We work very closely with them during our digital transformation and we focused very, very much on patient engagement. We are, take pride in being completely patient centered. The patient is the center of gravity of our existence and we invest all our energies in making sure that the patient will trust us to help them lead their best lives. You know, when people have a problem, they just don't go to a building, they go to another human being with the goal of that problem being solved. With that, we've been very careful and deliberate in seeking and partnering with folks who have the same goal in mind of helping people lead a good life. Uh, and Biomedics is one of those companies. So I want to thank Biomedics for hosting this webinar as well. They've been a great strategic partner for Mimit Health as we've been growing through this. We're one of the few unique healthcare organizations that now are fully digitally transformed and continuing on that uh, digital transformation journey and virtual health. You probably know and you've taken flights uh, sometime in your life, if some of you may have been flying all the time, and no flight ever leaves an airport anywhere in the world without the control tower knowing without a flight plan. The patient journey is no different and we need care plans for that. And we've gone to the extent of having a clinical operations center and making sure that there are care coordinators, just like you have, you know, flight uh, coordinators who are always monitoring a flight as to where they go. We follow the patient through their entire journey and make sure that they keep a good, healthy lifestyle. They're preventing diseases, they're aware of problems, but when they happen, we diagnose them well, we solve those problems, we make sure that they continue to stay healthy along that pathway. Uh, for those of you who would like to check us out, uh, you can check it out at mimithealth.com. I call this enlightened healthcare. And uh, the paradigm is one that we, we say things like, we put the care back in healthcare. And one of our core values is kindness. If one is not kind, you can't care. If you don't care, you shouldn't be in healthcare. And with that premise, I founded Mimit back in 2003. We've been rapidly growing as a group, but in a new paradigm of being fully digitally transformed. Uh, we have several, we're in the Chicagoland area with ambitions to grow uh, and serve uh, different available markets throughout the country. And we are now at multiple facilities. So we see a patient at home, in a nursing home, in assisted living, in clinics, in hospitals, and wherever else they may be. And our focus is on minimally invasive therapies. And we believe that the cost should be the least and one of the biggest costs is the cost of the human existence and the body. And uh, we, we treat the spirit, the mind and the body, and we go all the way from not just having a diagnosis and doing a procedure, but actually taking care of the human being. We care for a lot of patients who have vascular disease and problems with their lower extremities, but that leg is attached to a human being. 
and we want to make sure that we are fully centered around them, uh, centered on them. We know everything about them to help them lead their best lives. And with that in mind, we make sure that we are not just focused on doing a procedure here and there and looking at revenues, but actually making sure that the patients have a good experience and good outcomes. So one of the things we call it is Amazonification. I'm sure all of you buy things at Amazon and Amazon, you feel Amazon knows everything about you and they deliver. It's all about execution. You could look up a product or some solution uh, and have it at your doorstep within a short time. And the logistics, they'll text you, they'll call you. And if you have a problem, they solve it for you rapidly. Why can not healthcare be like that? With that paradigm, we've been on this journey where we are centered on our patients. We are connected with them. We collaborate to make sure that we are constantly working towards patient success and we are constantly innovating as well. And we live in this outcome economy. Every one of us, I had an 88 or nine year old patient today who's in the office connecting with us, checking her mobile phone. She's got a schedule. We texted her right from the, so that she could connect with us right from our system, right in the clinic. And we're we kind of, she's well informed. And what's happened today is Consumers, regardless of the age, it's not just millennials, but they want to be proactive, they're curious, they're demanding, they're very cost conscious, they're very discerning, and they want to make sure that we are right on top of this. Now, we provide patient-centered, connective, and collaborative care within this paradigm of doing things better, faster, and cheaper. And to do that, we adopted the best of breed systems across the industries, brought them in, and we utilize a holistic approach to deliver care. And one of the principles we've lived by is you wanna give the right information to the right people at the right time to make the right decisions for the right reasons and right rewards. And with that paradigm, we say we focus on the patient, patient lives in communities, we focus on the community. But we think global and act local. We'll take solutions from wherever we will find them, especially in this virtual era, and bring it and, and make sure that makes an impact on our patients. Coming back to this entire concept of flight plans and care plans, most people and most clinicians and providers will come up with a care plan and say, oh, here's the patient, this is the problem, this is why they came in, and this is what they think is going on. They write their care plan, but how do you execute it? We actually have taken that where we make deliberate care plans and just like a flight controller will do that. We have care coordinators in our clinical operations center that will coordinate the care of the patient, which actual tasks and actionable items for different people. We track the patient's household. We track their care problems, their care plans, who's doing what, etc. And we make sure we take them all through the journey. We talked about Amazon as a company, but if you look at any world-class organization, I'm sure you shop at Costco, some any of the big companies that you look at. This is uh, something I thought through and, and I've not seen it much in the literature, in the business literature anywhere, but the first thing is these companies will give you an excellent product or service, whatever that may be, whether it's Amazon, whether it's Costco. The second is if you have a problem, they will give you excellent customer service. You will rarely meet a employee at any of these companies, especially those who are customer facing, who are unhappy. They, they keep their employees very satisfied. The fourth pillar is they are fiscally responsible. And what do I mean by that? They will be profitable, but they will add excellent value for you. Look at Amazon, look at Costco. You know you can get it from somewhere else, but you, they'll give you a better deal, but they make money as well. The fifth and one of what I consider the most important is the cycle of continuous improvement and innovation. You will see they're constantly doing that. They execute brilliantly. And the final one is that they sustain the first five. They have systems built in. They have a systems mentality that puts in where they build in that platform centered on the patient, centered on the customer, and going through these pillars of success. Now, medical practices are no different. And as the medical practice grows, it reaches a maturity point. You need some plateaus, and there can, there's a 
process of natural decay, if you would. At that point is when we need to start adapting to change rapidly, staying focused on the patient, and then start looking at innovation. And that's what we've done. And as part of that, that's how biomedics came into our world as well as innovation. I've been with them from their very first uh, iteration of their product. You look at Amazon, did something similar. But when you look at Amazon, what they did was, you know, in a hyperscalable companies, they rarely go out and just build things and hope things will come. They look for one, the need. Second is they said, where do we have excess capacity? Whatever that can be. And you can see Amazon has leveraged the Amazon Web Services, which they initially built for themselves and made it into a enormous revenue generator for them by solving other people's problems. They did the same with Alexa and voice. They had come out with the Amazon phone, but when they failed with that, and that's what Jeff Bezos, I think, is the one who talked about difference between failing and failure. If you try something for the first time, it's an experiment, you've never done it before. You wanna try it fast, fail fast, learn all the lessons, and then go out and succeed. But if it's something that you do every day and you're supposed to be the best at it, you shouldn't be failing. And if you keep failing at it, then you are a failure. That's my paraphrasing of this. But having said that, one of the reasons we connected with PadNet, I remember having discussions with in an entrepreneur forum with some significant leaders who had developed large products. And we always talked about how patients are having amputations, PADs, a lad uh, is a... Uh, or a disease or problem that's affecting a lot of people and it's also silent, was how do we find these patients, these human beings who have this problem, they don't even know there is a problem. And that's when we started to realize we need tools that can go out there, find these patients, screen them, help them. And Biomedics with one of their tools came out to be a good solution for us. And we started the journey with primary care podiatrists and other physicians who could screen for these problems, find it early, at least detect the possible possibility that they have PAD, then check it out, diagnose it, come up, and then treat it. These are chronic conditions. Now, as we talked about it, if you take care of your customer, your patient, in the end, you will have better financial outcomes as well. But at the same token, when you find these diseases early, prevent amputation, overall you're helping the system by reducing healthcare costs. Yeah, imagine living with an amputation. You don't want one. So the patient's experience is better. For us as physicians, if you haven't taken care of that patient early and they land up with an amputation, there's liability exposure. And obviously it helps the practice do better. With that, we started adopting uh, the biomedic system. It's a very uh, simple system where you can actually, uh, it's, it's small, it's compact, the CPT codes are available, they are billable, and you can do ankle brachial indices along with the pulse volume recording. You can do a full arterial study. You can also do post-exercise with it. This is a sample performer that they had put together for practices where they can actually do well. It's legal, it's ethical, and it helps people. I remember being with the very first version of PadNet. This is still the PadNet 2.0 to where they finally got to the fourth generation and now they have what's PadNet, uh, PadNet Express, a very good tool that works very quickly and can help patients very quickly. It's, it's completed very soon. It's with an iPad or a computer, easy to do. The interpretation is automatic and has several other benefits. So the primary care office, as well as the podiatrist, is where we start with the screening for these patients and making sure. Uh, we are heavily invested in analytics and, and understanding what possibly could be wrong. We identify those patients. As you can see that a uh, primary care practice that uses the uh, American call, uh, ACA and the AHA criteria the, uh, for PAD assessment, identified 13% of patients with at least some stenosis and five patients with severe stenosis that you could then prevent the high risk of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular morbidity and mortality. And this actually helps a lot. So there's, uh, in, in, this is very accurate, uh, as high as 88%. 
uh, specificity, sensitivity of 93%. This was seen in 300, in 302 patients in a study that we did. The, the reference test is a gold standard. The study results confirmed outstanding diagnostic accuracy with the PadNet Express, and that, that is something that was really important. We actually, in a uh, skilled facility, screened all the patients who opted in. We did 61 of those studies. There were only five who had a previous diagnosis of PAD, and we found 93% of them were abnormal and f identified 47 patients uh, with PAD. This correlated with the well-known risk factors of diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia with these patients. Now, we use these tools, but now what happens after that? We, as we said earlier, and one of the core things to talk about is being uh, on a digitally transformed platform. With the patient in our center of our universe, we then connect with them, we collaborate across all departments, teams, referring physicians, using all the available tools to make sure that we can achieve what I call better, faster, and cheaper care. But you're keeping the cost down, you're getting better outcomes, and you're doing this. I call this medicine or healthcare at the speed of life. We are used to Uber Eats. We are used to Uber showing up. We're used to Amazon delivering. But healthcare, oh my God, it, it gets painful. We're trying to cut through all that. Patients can text us. They can live chat with us. They can email us. We do televisits, etc. So we do what we call a connected and coordinated patient journey. The first is to attract these patients. Biomedics and PadNet, the tool, is one of those things. Once we find them, we know we are here, they have a problem, we can help them. We then serve them with whatever we need to do first is identify the, diagnose, uh, the disease, diagnose it well, help prevent its, its exacerbation, help prevent uh, amputations, or whatever else there may be, but then keep them engaged for, and we do patient journeys, etc. But the patient for life philosophy that we've adopted we use data, we individualize the, whether it's acquiring them in the first place, treating them. There's a difference between personal care and personalizing care. Personal is just one person being always there, but you can't scale it. Personalization is when you have digitized and now virtually transformed your platform where you can scale this and hyperscale this. So talking a little bit about our digital transformation, most people think that transformation is just buying new technology. I've been entering stuff into the EMRs of the world for 30 years. What comes out? Nothing. But really what we are getting to the point of today on our platform, one of the reasons Amazon succeeded so well was early on they insisted that they must work on a platform and they compete and collaborate at the same time. But what they did with that was they got to know the behavior of their customers, what they like, how do they do it, what do they do, because could they continuously innovate it around it. We have started doing the same. What we have done here is on our platform, we go from the first time of patient acquisition when they come into a lead, all the way to the analytics. When we take care of a patient, when we do some work today, once that information is put in, it's in our data warehouse and on our analytics platform and on dashboards within 48 hours, 24 to 48 hours, sometime almost live. Talking a little bit about digital transformation journeys. For years, I started my career when we were doing x-rays manually. Everything was written in paper charts and there were files rooms, there were medical record offices and just paper everywhere. Then came the, the digitization. There were scanners up the wazoo, OCR. And what we were doing was taking the analog information and converting it to a digital format, whether they were images, documents. But it didn't change anything. They were just, you were looking at the same thing except on a screen instead of a piece of paper. Then came digitalization, which was it was technology driven. Instead of taking a paper and scanning it, you actually entered it into the computer directly and our electronic medical record, the same with PACs. But still there was nothing coming back at me. 
and no in insights coming to me, no actionable. What should I do next? What's missing on this patient? What's the care gap? None of that. And digital transformation is the actionable insights you get from the data being processed and digested. But to do that, you have to have an ecosystem around this, and which is something we've done. Yes, we have all the data systems. We had to democratize data. So we make sure that everybody involved from the front desk to all the people at the back end, the physicians, the providers, everybody else could see what they need to see. Data literacy, garbage in, garbage out. How do we make sure they know they got to put the right information in there? Then making sure who's accountable for what and having kind of a master record as well as making sure that things were entered right then to get that analyzed and then getting actionable insights from there. What should we do with this? You've all heard of the seven Vs of data, it's, where it says very high volume the, in, in today's world, uh, is what they call big data, the high volume, the high variety, the high velocity, the veracity, the variability. You now want to visualize it, visualize it and get value out of it. So when you look at analytics, we've been stuck by looking at the past something happens, we look at a report and say, what happened? And you then try to do some descriptive analytics around it. Most times it says, well, why did it happen? And we do some diagnostic, but it's all in the past. What's starting to happen more and more is predictive app uh, analytics is, hey, what will happen? But even further as you optimize it is, how can we prevent something? How can we make it happen? Prescriptive analytics. And that is becoming more and more common uh, with AI and everything else. Now, I could certainly talk about this forever, but if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, uh, whether it's about the biomedics product, our, our, our digital transformation journey, et cetera. I'll, I'll throw this back to Chris. Uh, if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Chopra. Yeah, so um, for everyone on this, uh, on this webinar, uh, just, um, we had a few people, uh, join a little bit late. Uh, there is a Q and a, uh, chat, uh, option. You can click on that to ask any questions. Uh, we have a few already teed up through the session here, Dr. Chopra. I'll, I'll get to those in just a minute. Um, in addition, if you wanted to ask it, uh, in person, you can raise your hand and I can provide you with the, the ability to, to verbally ask a question too. So. Uh, Dr. Chopra, it looks like the first one, I'm going to kind of uh, interpret what uh, came across in the chat window, and this is not an uncommon question that we get from primary care physicians, is uh, Dr. Chopra, as a vascular specialist, um, are, can you confirm uh, you, really, you want your community physicians to be doing PAD testing? I think there's that, that uh, concern that a uh, primary care physician is potentially stepping on a vascular specialist toes by doing the PAD testing in their office? No, not really, because, you know, uh, the primary care physician knows the patient for a long time. This is a hidden condition. I will never see the patient. Uh, and when I see, it'll be very late as a vascular specialist. So I really prefer that they do this and find these problems early. And remember, PAD is a chronic condition. And this is something that they will have for life. This is not even reversible to uh, a large degree. You just can pause it. So I prefer that the PAD does the screening test up front and finds them really early. So I don't think it's a problem at all. I think it's a very good thing, actually. Well, that's a good segue um, into the next question. So I'm going a little bit out of order. So sorry about ever, everyone about this, but um, totally makes sense to ask this next. Um, can you speak a little bit to the... I'm sorry, I'm just trying to read this. Um, the value of screening. Um, I guess the question is, if I if disease is, is detected earlier, um, what sort of uh, clinical benefits are experienced by, by doing that, by screening patients that don't have primary indications? Yeah, so, you know, I, I see a lot of these patients. You know, they you can have mild PAD, moderate PAD, or very severe. And by the time they're severe, they get critical and they're looking at amputations the cost of an amputation is very high, the cost to the body as well as financially, but similarly is the cost of having a severe problem and having a lot of procedures. So we prefer to find it very early, look at all the risk factors, whether it's smoking, we do counseling against that, 
get them on exercise programs, get uh, tell them to manage their uh, their diet, their weight. So obesity is a huge risk factor, diabetes, uh, hyperlipidemia, etc. And then we try to manage that all early. One of the things to realize that the underlying cause of PAD is atherosclerosis, which is the same problem that causes heart attacks, coronary artery disease, and cerebrovascular disease and strokes. So a patient who is found to have PAD is at the same risk of having morbidity and mortality as somebody who has angina and who, or is having a TIA. So it, if you catch this early and it being a chronic condition, and I've had patients I've had for 20 plus years who, when we caught them early, kept them on regimens, got them to lose weight, got them on exercise programs, and have kept them on antiplatelet agents are doing well 20 years later versus them having caught a bad problem and then come to us at a late stage. I hope that answers your question and makes sense to you. Yeah, I'll kind of keep monitoring the, the Q&A window and see if there's any follow-up on that. So feel free to keep asking questions if you'd like. Um, Dr. Chopra, it seems like the next one is most likely coming from a podiatrist. Uh, they're asking about bunionectomies and um, would you recommend uh, screening uh, for PAD prior to, um, they're saying bunionectomy as an example procedure, but maybe um, you know, any time that you're doing a lower extremity procedure in the office? Yes. So one of the things we work with a lot of podiatrists and one of the things we say is there are some certain criteria. Anybody above 65, somebody who's had uh, an x-ray and have calcium in their vessels, uh, diabe diabetics who are also smokers. Uh, so some of these risk factors when they have it, if they don't feel a pulse and there's some possibility that there's hidden PAD, it is good to screen and make sure that before they operate that the vascular system is good. Uh, many, many years ago, when I first started this, I had a patient who was referred to me by a podiatrist. He called me panicked. On a Sunday uh, evening, he said he had a patient. He had just done the surgery on Friday. It looked good. Had, and then her toe was getting black and he was panicked. You know, it was discolored. He had her come. Uh, the next morning, Monday, she was in my office, and we found a lesion in a couple of a couple of lesions, in different vessels, which earlier it, they just didn't find. Now we were able to treat it very quickly, and she, all she lost was a little bit of the front of that toe. But you can imagine that patient wasn't happy. The podiatrist was terrified of uh, the outcome, and since then, obviously, he screens for every patient, and it's a good thing to do. It's just a screening test, after all. So I think it makes perfect sense to screen and make sure that there's good vascular flow. Okay, well, that's great. Um, it looks like there, uh, there are some questions about the, the SNF uh, screening project. Um, I know that that was something that we worked with you on, but um, it sounds like they were uh, kind of asking about um, kind of what happened after the screening event and all those new PAD uh, patients were identified in that environment. Uh, it's no different than anywhere else. The, you know, patients just live there. It's their home for that time. They just happen to have a nurse nearby. But I think like any patient, once we know that we've identified the possibility of this disease, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe, uh, the the primary care physician or the facility will put us and others on consult, whoever's available to take care of them, and evaluate. You, you first do a good clinical evaluation from a vascular point of view. Uh, second is to make sure that those patients had some imaging, whether it's ultrasound or whatever else, and then dis discern whether they have significant disease or not. And if you find mild to moderate disease, doesn't need any interventions, but you follow that, you take care of it, you put them on the antiplatelets and other regimens, make sure all the risk factors are also under control. But if they're severe, and then obviously then you consider further treatment. But once you've identified the patient, then we actually, you, you step in and take care of them. Just as you detect hypertension, you detect uh, aneurysms or whatever else they may be, but you screen for that so that you can help them. Okay, well, that is, uh, that, that's great. Um, so just a reminder to the attendees of this webinar, thanks again for attending. Um, uh, I'm going to wait for just, a, I'm going to ask one more question that I, I personally have, um, but while uh, Dr. Chopra is answering that, feel free to ask any last minute questions and then we can wrap up this session. 
Uh, Dr. Chopra, it looks like uh, with September being PAD Awareness Month, you're offering uh, free screenings uh, for PAD. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? What inspired you to do that? Um, any kind of uh, aha moments from the first couple of days of that effort? Yeah, you know, one of the things you realize is for, for many years now is patients show up so late and they go, wish I'd known, wish I'd known. So in this awareness month, you know, both digitally and, and uh, kind of non-digitally, we've been able to spread the word. And if anybody has any thought around it, but they may have it or they have any symptoms, we actually do screening for them. We use the PadNet Express for that just to see if they're normal, they're normal. But it, it, this way, we actually help people at least identify if they have something hidden. And it's it's very valuable. It helps the patients, of course. It helps our community and it definitely helps us too. But it, if nothing else, it helps us engage with our community and our patients and make sure that we can help them. Well, that's great. Um, yeah, thanks for that, uh, Dr. Chopra. So looking at the Q&A session, it looks like uh, we're through the questions, didn't have any uh, last minute questions. Um, and uh, I do appreciate you taking the time out, a busy evening, um, especially here uh, in early fall. Um, but if you have any uh, final remarks, uh, feel free to, you know, uh, add them here. But uh, yeah, I think that kind of concludes. No, I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity and people can reach out to me. And, and uh, I'm sure you'll have this online available and other social media, et cetera. But if people feel free to reach out to me if I can be of any help. And thank you again. Yep. Thank you again, Dr. Chopra. And thanks everyone for taking time out of your busy day to attend this. Have a great night. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.